Okay, welcome to another episode of The Zach Hiley Show. Today, we're going to talk about how to manage stress to avoid brain remodeling and maximize cognitive performance. And the reason I want to talk about this is the first kind of episode, I talked about all the medical specialties. The second one, I talked about ways to study better. The third one, this one, I want to talk about stress's interaction on your, in your cognitive functioning because there's this upside-down U-shaped curve, and when you get past a certain point in stress, your cognitive performance goes down significantly. And also when you are stressed consistently for a long period of time, there are actual changes in the brain. And they see this not only in mice, but in humans, specifically in your hippocampus and amygdala. So what I want to talk to you about today during this episode are ways we can manage our stress, things we can do to lower our stress mindset. Maybe this is exercise. Maybe this are other certain mental tricks we do. So we can lower our stress levels to be at the top of this upside-down U-shaped curve and also prevent remodeling of our brain, which is pretty bad news. So I'm going to go over three evidence-supported implementation things to help our stress, and these are things we can do daily. Uh, so the first thing, let's just jump right, right into it. I want to talk about that the WHO says stress is the second most frequent health problem, and it's associated with cardiovascular disease, obesity, and depression. So not only do we want to manage our stress to kind of help with our cognitive performance, prevent remodeling of our brain, but you know, our cardiovascular health is pretty important. That's the biggest killer in the entire world is cardiovascular disease is the biggest killer. Next is cancer. Uh, but we also will help with obesity and also manage our depression. So guess what? The first thing I'm going to talk about, the thing that you should be annoyed by me talking about this time is exercise and sleep and medical disorders. As always, when you get these things in order, it should help these other things get managed. There are a couple of studies that show people who exercise are less stressed. People who sleep more are less stressed. And also then if you have your general clinically significant conditions under control, your stress level should be under control. So don't try to pull the levers, which I'm going to talk about, which are around different ways and methods around thinking, before you get your sleep, before you get your exercise, and before you get your physical health under control. If you have a psychiatric condition, maybe this is anxiety, right, or depression, or maybe a few of you actually have psychotic conditions, these should be conditions that are managed. Of course, there's no medical advice. Speak to your doctor before doing anything right. But these should be conditions that are managed and maximized to the most benefit, to the most improvement of your health before you even start to attack these mental tricks and these mental models. Uh, I just want to go over two or three quick studies and then we'll jump into the medical tricks that we can do, the mental tricks we can do. So in one study, college students participating in certain activities were questioned on mood and anxiety before and after class. Swimmers had an unusually positive before swim mood and reported less tension and confusion after swimming. Yoga participants were significantly less anxious, tense, depressed, angry, fatigued, and confused after class than before the yoga class. So how much exercise should we be doing? Well, that's really person to person. And again, speak to your doctor before you do any kind of exercise. But the American Heart Association recommends at least 150 minutes per week of aerobic activity, like walking or tennis doubles, or 75 minutes per week of vigorous aerobic activity. And this could be running or tennis singles. A combination of aerobic and vigorous aerobic activity is preferable. Uh, they also recommend muscle strengthening at least two days a week, less time sitting, what I'm doing right now, and increasing intensity of all of the above as you can because they actually showed a dose-response curve, which means the more of this thing you do in regards to outcomes such as cardiovascular health, depression, uh, and early mortality, orally all-cause mortality, which is huge. And again, these are associations, uh, but the associations... Can I think they say even at one point in one study that the exercise can even relate to causality, which is a big statement to make, right? Because we need certain things before we can make the jump from association to causality. We need to make sure these things are not random events, that the statistic is that is statistically significant. Uh, we need to make sure that it's scientifically reasonable, right? We need to make sure that these, these things make sense. And we need to make sure, of course, that we have the evidence to support this, that this is maybe a cause and not just association. Okay. So now that we've talked about that, and those are the first things you want to get in more to remember exercise, sleep, and um, your other general health conditions, let's talk about a few little, a few other things that most people kind of will be able to fix and get in order to reduce stress, prevent this brain remodeling, 
and also get uh, some better cognitive performance. Okay, so the first thing when I think about lowering stress and based off the research is alcohol and caffeine in the general public. Number one, alcohol makes your sleep worse. There's evidence that shows just one drink a night before night will make your sleep significantly worse. Alcohol also affects certain structures in your brain, uh, and these, these changes accumulate over time, right, the more alcohol you drink. So the first lever I would pull would be alcohol. The second lever is caffeine, right? Caffeine has this magical way of making us feel a little bit more stressed out, a little bit more anxious, and you really need to figure out who you are as a person. For example, if you're generally a high-strung person, you probably shouldn't drink that much caffeine in the morning because this will just increase the high-strungness that you are. So you've fixed your sleep, you've fixed your health to the best degree you can, and you've started exercising. The next thing I would do is try and cut out alcohol if you're feeling too stressed, and also try and cut out caffeine if you're feeling too stressed. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about, and these are important things, and we're going to delve deeper into these things, are positive mindset, eliminating negative thinking, and focusing on positive thinking. So the first thing I want to talk about is eliminating negative thinking. And you've probably heard of these things before, filtering, magnifying, and focusing on the negative. So filtering is, for example, you say, someone says, uh, you know, you're really, really good at tennis, but you need to work on your forehand, and also you should work on your footwork. Uh, and you only focus on the negative. So you only focus on, oh, you should focus on your footwork. Oh, you should really work on your forehand or something like that. This is a habit that we all fall into. Occasionally, someone will give you feedback and you focus significantly on the bad things. Try not to focus on the bad things, right? Try to focus more on the good things, on the positive. Of course, constructive criticism you shouldn't ignore, but if someone is just being generally mean, there's no need to focus on those things. Focus more on positive thinking, okay? So, Magnifying is another thing. Like, so, for example, if someone says, uh, these, are, these are often YouTube video titles, right? And something maybe I even do, right? If you don't sleep, life's going to be bad, right? If I say something like that. You may magnify this to the say, like, if I don't sleep properly, it's over. I'm going to die. I'm not going to be able to think properly. I'm going to have an unhappy life and everything will be bad. It's probably not true, right? If you, you can slowly change your sleep, even with bad sleep, your life probably isn't going to be awful. It's not going to kill you tomorrow, right? So, and I'm not saying don't sleep because maybe if you don't sleep for a certain amount of time, you actually can die. But, but again, don't, don't worry about that. Stop magnifying things to the worst possible scenario. Just because you got a C on your test, the world isn't going to end. Just because you asked someone out and they said, no, you aren't going to be shunned from the community, right? Don't go down these steps. Oftentimes, people really, really don't care about what you're thinking and they're not thinking about you all the time. So don't think they are and don't magnify things to the extremes. Finally, focus on positive thinking. It's a magical, magical thing when you can start focusing on the good things going on in your life. Oh, the temperature outside is really nice. Oh, it's amazing that I have use of all four of my limbs. It's amazing that my mom and dad are still alive. It's amazing that I'm able to kind of go to this school and, and practice medicine and learn to study these amazing, really cool things. I live in a country that has relatively good freedom, right? I'm not at worry for my life or safety. I have a roof over my head. I have access to food. These are all amazing things that I cherish dearly. Uh, and if you can start to think about the positive things and focus on the positive things, your happiness will improve and you will be less stressed out. Uh, personalizing is another thing we fall into often. Uh, and personalizing is saying everything is my fault. So for example, which might be good sometimes when you're trying to improve, but for silly things, it really, really can't do it. Uh, this is a, a thing that oftentimes, sometimes kids do, right? When their parents get divorced, sometimes they say they blame it on themselves. My parents got divorced because of me, and they're so sad, and of course they're sad, uh, but usually it's not often the kids' faults, right? It's not completely the kids' fault. They shouldn't put all the blame, all the onus on themselves, and it's actually not healthy for them to do that. They'll be more stressed out and more sad, and it's really a bad thing to personalize everything to yourself. Sometimes things just happen. You know what I mean? And you just can't focus everything on that or you'll become more stressed out and bad. So what I would suggest doing with these first kind of tips, which is focusing on the positive thinking, try and spin things, identify things and spin them to a positive. So for example, uh, a good thing could do, maybe you did poorly on a test, right? You did poorly on an exam. Well, that's not great. But you know, now you know what you need to focus on. Now you know what to, you need to learn and how to study better. Maybe you can try out a different study technique. Maybe this was just a quiz that you did poorly on. And it's not that big a deal to be badly on a quiz. Maybe this is a great wake-up call for you to change your studying techniques and focus on doing something, things differently for when the test comes up, right? So 
Identify something that's going on and spin it positive. Notice the good things around you. Notice the great things around you, the positive things. I guarantee you there are good things around you. And try to spin things to positive even if they seem really, really bad. And when you get good at this, I swear, it's like a superpower. When you're able to spin things positive, spin away from the negative, it's a great, great technique and strategy you can take throughout your entire life. And also, people just like it more. People don't like to be around people that are very negative and sad and complaining and saying doom and gloom kind of thing. If you think of that Saturday Night Live sketch where it's sketch where there's that lady who's really sad and really complaining all the time, no one wants to be around her. So don't be that person. Kind of be happy, be positive. Of course you can be realistic, but spin things positive and you'll be more happy, you'll be less stressed, and I think you'll get a little bit more out of life. I know it's a big statement, but I found it to be personally true. Then be open to humor. Have humor in your life. There's actually studies that show people who report a greater sense of humor and have been reported or judged as having a greater sense of humor actually have more happiness in their life and they're less stressed out. And I think it's just a good way to go about life too. If you can see the humor humor in things, if you can see the funniness in everything in life, life's gonna be a little bit, a little bit better. The next thing is work on your self-esteem. And this is really, really important. There are actually studies that show there's an association between self-esteem and life expectancy. Also, self-esteem and depression are strongly, strongly related. And this is a hard thing to work on. Maybe you need to speak to a therapist. Maybe you need to speak to a doctor about improving your self-esteem. But this is something that's dramatically, has, can have a dramatic impact on your life, depression, and like how long you live possibly. And that's shown with the association studies. Um, so focus on improving your self-esteem. And what ways can you do this? Well, I like to think of things that I'm good at. Um, for example, you can make a list of things you're good at. So for example, who comes to you with questions? Who asks you questions? Sometimes people come to me with questions about studying and things like that. How should I study better? So that means maybe I'm a good teacher. Maybe I'm helpful to people on the internet. Um, sometimes people come to me, like my parents come to me and ask me about technological advice. So maybe I'm good at technology and things like this. Focus on kind of things you are good at and this will hopefully improve your self-esteem, okay? And again, self-esteem is one of those really, really important things to improve. Another mental thing that's really helpful is meditation. Meditation can be practiced by anyone, anywhere, at any time. So before I talk about the how, let's talk about the why. So 22 patients with generalized anxiety disorder or panic disorders were assessed before and during meditation-based stress reduction programs that took place over eight weeks. Self ratings and therapist ratings were gathered during the three months following treatment, and 20 out of 22, that's 91%, of the patients showed significant reduction in anxiety and depression. Amazingly, at a three-year follow-up, 18 out of 22 of the participants, because four of them just didn't show up, so 18 out of 18, or 100%, maintain their originally observed clinical improvements in every outcome measure. That's an amazing study. That's showing that people who went through these meditation-based retreats showed significant improvements in their anxiety and depression. And when followed up three years later, regardless of whatever they did, they all showed that same clinical improvement when they were followed up with three years later. And again, this include clinically significant anxiety, depression, and panic. So how can we meditate? Again, meditation can be practiced by anyone at any time anywhere. At a very basic level, it means sitting still and trying to kind of, and this is just kind of a mindfulness meditation practice and focus on what you're thinking. So here's my meditation practice. You can adapt this however you want. So what you'll do is you'll sit down in a quiet place, right? Turn your phone off, turn everything off and set a timer for 10 minutes. Then take three deep, slow breaths, right? So slower than that, right? And then what I like to do is I like to scan my body from head to toe. And you're not moving the whole time and your eyes are closed while this is happening, right? You don't have to close your eyes necessarily. This is just what I do. So you'll scan your body from head to toe, focusing maybe on the feeling of the, your scalp and then kind of the pressure in between and the tension in between your eyebrows, uh, relaxing your eyes, releasing your tongue to the roof of your mouth, letting your cheeks sag down and go all the way down your shoulders, your hands, your chest, your abdomen, uh, your legs, your knees, your feet, and kind of take a checkup, right, to see what's going on. Because the whole point of this mindfulness meditation is not necessarily to change or fix things. It's just to note and kind of see what's going on in your body, see how you're feeling, see how everything's functioning kind of from your head to your toe. Uh, and then what I like to do is just kind of count my breaths. So I'll breathe in and out through my nose. 
focus on the feeling of the air coming out of my nose and count to 10. So this would be. That's one. That's two. And you go all the way up to 10. And then you can just repeat that and really try to pay attention to thoughts and things that come into your head. Notice these thoughts, but let them kind of go by you. If you're thinking about things you're going to do later, if you're thinking about things you previously did, try not to latch on to these things. Try to kind of let them go. And of course, there's tons and tons and tons and tons of different forms of meditation and strategies you can do. The first place I would look is this Insight Timer, which is a free app on your phone. Then you can go to Headspace or Calm. Again, these are apps that I pay for, uh, but they're not sponsoring this podcast in any way, shape, or form. And they've had fantastic impacts on my life. At a very basic level, you can try the 478 breathing technique, which is breathing in for four seconds, holding it for seven seconds. and then breathing out for eight seconds. And then repeat that three times. And this is a really, really good breathing technique. This is actually evidence-based breathing technique that people can use to reduce anxiety and feelings of kind of craziness. You can almost tell it in my voice right now. Even a rapidified, and that's a word I just made up, of the 478 breathing technique has just made me a little bit more calmer. I think sometimes I speak a little bit too fast, especially on these things. So hopefully that made me a little bit calmer and it made me slow down a little bit. Okay, so four, seven, eight breathing technique. Um, the other technique is progressive muscle relaxation. Uh, so that's kind of tensing a part of your body and then for maybe three seconds, holding it and then letting it go and focusing on that part of the body as it kind of relaxes. So you can start with your fingers, right? Then maybe you do your forearm, then your bicep, then your chest, then your other arm, then your shoulder, you can squeeze your eyebrows together and really go from foot to head. And this is a fantastic relaxation technique that I use sometimes when I'm feeling stressed out or anxious or anything like that. And again, these are all evidence-based techniques that I'm mentioning, techniques that are used to reduce stress and anxiety because we want to bring those levels to reasonable levels. We want to be at the middle of the upside-down shaped U-curve so we can focus on improving cognitive performance and kind of our performance in general. When we get too stressed out, it's shown by the data that our performance just isn't as good with certain things. Okay, so you want to keep it at the middle of this curve. Other random things I'm going to talk about, uh, mindfulness. We just went over a mindfulness meditation, but this is kind of just like when you're outside, right? When you're outside going for a walk, for example, focus on the feeling of the pressure under your feet, the temperature of the air around you, the sounds of the city. Try not to be on your phone. Try not to be listening to a podcast. When you're eating, right, just eat. This is really hard to do. When you're going to the gym and you're working out, Try not to listen to music. Try just to kind of focus on the lifting and the muscles. I made this change like three months ago, and it was a really, really hard change because I think I had this kind of dopamine mixing, right? Because I had the effects from the music, which was making me pumped up and making me happy. And then I also had the effects from the gym. And the gym was a really cool, like, lifting. It rele naturally releases these endorphins and these feel-good chemicals, but they were kind of getting mixed with the music. And when I tried to just listen to music, or when I tried to just kind of focus on my lifting and stuff like that, I didn't feel as good as I normally feel. And that's because they've kind of, I was depending on them to be mixed together. About a month after kind of just working out, I started to get that feeling back, that good, happy endorphin feeling, those rushes that you get kind of from doing really hard workouts. Uh, and now I don't listen to any music when I'm at the gym or anything like that. Another thing, good thing to do is journaling. So my journaling practice is just five minutes after I wake up in the morning and I'll write one big goal for the day, two things I'm grateful for, three small tasks, and then a brain dump. And the brain dump is literally anything. It could be a bullet point about something cool or funny or interesting that I saw in the hospital. It could be a bullet point about a recent interaction I had with my family or someone I'm like in a relationship with or whatever. It could be anything. It's just kind of a little bullet point note. And it's good because you do feel better. And that's why it's called a brain dump. Just like the other dump, you usually feel better after it. Gratitude practice, I use that in my kind of journal, but also it gets this awesome kind of feedback loop benefit when I use my mindfulness meditation, when I'm mindful when I'm walking outside, and I'll start to think, wait a second, these trees are really nice, it's cool that I live in this city, aren't I lucky to live in the city, all these kind of things, and it kind of makes you happier and less stressed. The next thing you want to do is you want to take breaks. Taking breaks is vital, and these can be run the gamut, right? So this could be what I do sometimes when I was taking my really, really important tests, uh, for example, when I was taking the MCAT or the SATs or when I go for my boards now, so step one, step two, 
after every section, I would do the four, seven, eight breathing technique three times. And that takes what, like 30 seconds maybe, or maybe 45 seconds a minute. And I, there are no studies, unfortunately, for this one. There's no evidence for this, but I'm pretty sure my performance went up because of it, because I would take that break, because I would wipe the slate clean of the thing I just studied. Maybe the section I was just on stressed me out. I was ready and prepared to attack the next session well. And then if you step it up a notch, you know, when you're studying, Pomodoro is a fantastic technique. So every 25 minutes, you take a five-minute break. And then the fourth time you take this break, you take a longer 30-minute break. Again, this is based off uh, the idea of ultradian cycles, or you can only stay s significantly focused for a certain period of time, and breaks can have a huge impact. Uh, otherwise, it's good to take maybe at least a half day off or preferably a day off every week when you're studying or working or something like that. It's a good way to reset. Uh, I talk about occasionally what breaks are best, but I like outside time. Uh, I like being in nature. I like exercising. I like hanging out with friends and things like this. I like to avoid alcohol. I like to avoid looking at TV screens. I like to avoid staying up super late at night. Um, and those kind of things, because I don't feel like I get the biggest benefit when I come back to. So if I have a full day of like spending outside and exercising, when I actually show up to do my studying or my test or whatever the next day, I feel much, much better than if I sat inside all day and like ordered pizza and like watched a movie and then like drank like a couple beers at night or something like that. That makes me feel kind of much, much worse. And I want to talk about one quick study to show how powerful the outside nature time is. So outside nature time is huge and it has a fantastic impact. And nature, see what they did there, actually did a study on this and they looked at nearly 20,000 people and their exposure to green spaces. And they said, the likelihood of reporting good health or high well-being becomes significantly greater with contact of greater than 120 minutes of time in nature with a positive association peaking between 200 and 300 minutes of time in nature per week. This was consistent across key groups, including older adults and those with long-term health issues. And you're ready for the ultimate combination exercise and outside time. This might be a run. This could be um, doing yoga outside in the park. This could be anything. But outside time is one of the biggest changes I've made in my life, I'd say in the past one or two years, and I'm so, so happy I did. I feel better. Of course, maybe it's because I think you'll feel better and I do feel better, but I think the outside time, sunlight has a magical, magical effect. There's actually studies that show people that are in a higher latitude condition, so or location, so that means they have less direct exposure to sunlight, are more likely to be depressed and have kind of these anxiety disorders and things like that. And again, correlation does not mean causation, so who knows if this sunlight is actually directly related to to the, these people being sad, more sad or less sad, um, but it's something to keep in mind. What I'm doing right now is I try to make sure I go on at least one walk every day in the morning, and that's about 10 to 15 minutes outside, getting some sunlight in my eyes, not looking at it, but kind of walking around the sunlight. I try to read outside as much as possible. So usually I have like an hour break or two hour break throughout the day, and I'll spend that time kind of outside reading. Uh, if I can eat lunch outside, that's an additional benefit. Uh, and what I've started doing on the weekends much, much more is going for long hikes in nature because well, that's the double winter combo, right, of exercise and nature time. Or I'll bring a blanket outside into the park and, like, read or study outside. Why can't you study outside, right? I don't like to mix my relaxing locations with my study locations. So if I'm studying outside, maybe I'll sit on a bench in the park as opposed to lay down on a blanket or something like that because classical conditioning is a thing, right? Classical conditioning is an important thing. And if you want to spend your time relaxing and your time relaxing is on this blanket in this certain area of the park, don't bring your work to that blanket in the certain area of the park because you want that time to be focused on kind of chilling out and relaxing. Um, okay, this is a shorter one. Usually I know my podcasts are longer, but these are just ev three evidence-based techniques to kind of focus on improving your stress, bringing yourself to the middle of that upside down U-shaped curve, it's trying to stop this remodeling of our amygdala and our hippocampus and improving cognitive performance. So, okay, what are we going to do? In summary, we're going to get our sleep in order. We're going to get our exercise in order, and we're going to get our general health conditions in order. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to try and cut alcohol and caffeine if we can. We're going to have a positive mindset, eliminate negative thinking, focus on the positive thinking. We're going to get rid of thinking about the worst case scenario, and we're going to spin things positive. We're going to work on our self-esteem by focusing on the things we're good at and talking to people that make us feel good, right? As opposed to associating with people that make us feel not so good. Maybe we'll start meditating. This could be five minutes a day. This could be 10 minutes a day. This could be maybe 20 minutes a day, which is my practice right now. And meditation, again, can be done anywhere, at any time, at any place. Maybe we'll do the four, seven, eight breathing technique 
or we'll do progressive progressive muscle relaxation or just kind of a mindfulness meditation. Uh, other things we might do to kind of help with our stress, we might journal, we might focus on our gratitude, we might take breaks, and finally, we'll spend time outside in nature because there's good evidence that shows the more time you're in nature, the more subjectively happy and less stress you feel. So spend some time outside. But that is it. Thank you so much for making it to the end of this podcast episode. And if you liked it, please leave a review. Please send it to your friends and tell me what you want to hear. What do you want to hear about? Do you like this format of podcast? Do you prefer when I just interview people? Uh, what do you think I should do? Because I'm having a lot of fun doing this. This is kind of nice. It lets me just kind of free talk as opposed to having those YouTube videos, which is like, boom, 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 boom. but yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for watching, listening, whatever you're doing. And uh, I'll see you on the next one.